My name is Christopher Tucker. It is November 26th of 2018, and I'm here at the Richard Russell Special Collections Library for a oral history interview with Dr. Gary Birch. Uh, now, Gary, I know you've had a, a extensive career here at the university, director of the Center for International Trade and Security, and founder of the international consultancy, Trade Secure, and I certainly want to dig into all of that and your career uh, throughout this interview, but if you could start us out by talking a little bit about um, your childhood and your interests and experiences that, you know, sort of led you to this place. Thank you, Chris. It's uh, good to be with you. I was born in Vallejo, California in 1944. Uh, my father worked uh, in the Mare Island shipyard outside of San Francisco repairing and refurbishing uh, ships during World War II. Uh, he grew up on a farm in the Dakotas, didn't really have any education and wanted to return to the farm. So he and my mother bought a small dairy farm outside of Boise, Idaho. Uh, it was only about 10 miles from Boise, but it was really in the, in the sticks. Uh, we uh, had no other children to play with within a mile or two. So my sisters and two sisters and a brother grew up uh, really enjoying farm life, working on the farm, getting up early every morning, feeding the chickens and calves, and as I got older, milking the cows. But uh, I never fell in love with farm life, to tell you the truth, particularly the cows and early morning milking. So uh, education was important to me. And I went through the public schools of small country schools. My, uh, my first uh, four years in school were in a two-room schoolhouse that had in one room grades one through four, about 15 students in the other room uh, grades four or five through eight and uh, uh, it was it was interesting and um, I had a great childhood loving parents and uh, they got me started. So as you say they got you started uh, did you always have an interest in international affairs and politics and global history or you know, that... my, uh, my father, who, as I mentioned, had just a few years of elementary school education, he was always interested in government and politics. And um, I think I got some of that from him. And then I was always interested in what's out there farther on beyond Idaho and the United States. I really felt the farm life was kind of uh, constraining and uh, had an interest in what was going on in a broader country and, and in the world. And uh, went on to Idaho State University. I was fortunate to get a, a football scholarship because there really wasn't any money in the family. And my, my parents, although they were loving parents, they didn't really understand what higher education was all about. And uh, at Idaho State, I studied government I had one wonderful professor who encouraged me. Uh, the best thing that happened to me at Idaho State on the very first day on campus, I discovered the love of my life. Uh, Joan, we've been married now for 54 years, and uh, we married as sophomores and had twins as juniors, so uh, we grew up pretty quickly. That made me uh, focus a little bit more, and that's when I really became a better student and, uh, and really developed my interest in academic uh, study and uh, observation of what was going on in the world. Um, we took off to Eugene, Oregon, where I did uh, my MA and PhD. Uh, that was a good experience and the best part of it was developing an interest in East and Central Europe. And, some of the conflicts over there. And I had a wonderful professor I worked under who was doing uh, 
some research on ethnic relations, nationalism in the former Yugoslavia. And uh, I became his research assistant and ended up writing my PhD dissertation on uh, nationalism and ethnic relations in the former Yugoslavia, the Croatian, Serbian, uh, and other relationships. Uh, and uh, I won a, uh, a postgraduate fellowship called uh, from the International Research and Exchanges Board to spend a year in the former Yugoslavia. And so my wife Joan and I packed up our twins and we'd never been out of the country. And it was a great opportunity uh, to travel abroad for the first time. And uh, we took off and uh, explored all of Yugoslavia. My dissertation was based upon interviews in every region and 24 different counties or communes as they called them then in the former Yugoslavia. So we went through Kosovo, Montenegro, Macedonia, up to the northern border of Austria and the Republic of Slovenia. And then we traveled uh, throughout the region. Uh, the Prague Spring and the Soviet crushing of the Prague, mm. Prague Spring had taken place just before we got to Yugoslavia. And we went to Prague and, and experienced the resentment and uh, the low morale among the people who wanted to develop their own political culture and identity. And uh, so traveling throughout, so I was hooked then. I knew that, uh, that that was what I wanted to study. Uh, just before we went to Yugoslavia, the University of Georgia offered me a, a job. I hadn't really applied for it, it was strange, but my professor, unbeknownst to me, had passed on my resume to a colleague at the University of Georgia and they called uh, for an interview. So uh, they gave me the job and gave me the first year off uh, leave of absence, which was wonderful. I think they uh, understood how green I was and I need a little more seasoning before they turned me lo loose in the classroom. I was really only uh, 24 years old at the time. And uh, so after Yugoslavia, my wife and I um, moved to Athens and that was the beginning of a very, uh, a very enjoyable and rewarding career and, and family life in this university town. Well, I, I've always wanted to, to ask you, after that, that first, sounds like pretty extensive trip, you know, through Yugoslavia, um, you said you, uh, you were hooked from that point on, mm -hmm. that you had the, the travel bug. You know, where else in the world were, were you really interested in at the time? And, you know, if you could also tell us a little bit about, you know, what was happening in the world that was capturing your interest as, you know, now a, a, a young professor having just done this uh, extensive tour and now moving the family to, to Georgia, you know, what was sort of capturing your, your attention? That's a, a good question and I have to remind myself and others that this was in the midst of the Cold War. There was some question whether the Yugoslavs would let me in to do my dissertation research, but because I had the backing, an official U.S. agency set up to promote academic study, they did. And traveling around throughout that country and other communist countries behind the so-called Iron Curtain, I realized that uh, they were people uh, that had many of the same interests and values that we did. They wanted uh, to raise a family. They wanted to have an education. Uh, they wanted uh, for their country and uh, communities to prosper. Uh, and I began to recognize that the Cold War was really keeping us from a better understanding of one another in the so-called East-West uh, capitalist communist divide. And uh, I spent my first few years at the University of Georgia focusing on courses teaching about these countries of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Um, I was in the field of comparative foreign area politics where I taught uh, 
courses at the university about what was going on in Czechoslovakia. And uh, at that time, it was uh, the binational state Czechoslovakia and the multinational state Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union. Uh, but as time went on, I really realized I was more interested in U.S. relations with these countries. Uh, what was the Cold War all, all about and what might uh, be done to overcome some of the difficulties? We were in this terrible nuclear arms race. Uh, fortunately, there was a wonderful man on campus at that time who came to the university the same year that I did, and that was the former Secretary of State, Dean Rusk. I remember toward the end of semesters, my first few years, I was running out of lectures and I told the students everything I thought I knew. And so uh, I wandered into Dean Rusk's office and said, uh, Mr. Secretary, and he said, just call me Dean. He was a wonderful, humble, uh, low maintenance sort of man for a former Secretary of State. And so he came into my classroom and gave a lot of wonderful lectures. And we began to speak more about uh, east-west relations and what was going on in the world. So that stimulated my, uh, my interest further. So I began to shift my work from the national politics of other countries to the relations between these countries in the United States and the Western Alliance. In those days, it was often referred to as east-west relations. I won a uh, fellowship to research, go to Europe and do research on strategic trade and technology transfer. In those days, we had a pretty strict embargo on trade with the Soviet Union and the East European countries. And I remember Dean Rusk asked me one day, what do you think, should we sell uh, the Soviet Union computers? And I thought about that and didn't really have a good answer. We were reluctant to sell them wheat, and uh, we weren't selling them computers. And he gave me the impression that he thought we were going overboard, that by loosening up, uh, that we might create better relations and that business and commerce could promote uh, more understanding. So I took off and went to Paris and London and Bonn, uh, the capitals of Eastern Europe, and. This was a great experience talking with officials and governments, and I found out that they were very interested in expanding relations with these countries. They believed uh, that this was not only good business, but good politics and uh, good for, uh, for history, uh, uh, historical development between these important parts of the world. Then I also uh, received a Fulbright professorship in England uh, about that time and in the 80s, I guess, and went and lived in England and did a lot of traveling there. And uh, I also um, got to uh, work with two different centers in English universities, one at the University of Birmingham and one at the uh, University of Lancaster and uh, there was some really fascinating work going on in these places. And when I came back to Georgia, I thought, well, you know, I really love being a professor. I love teaching more than anything. And uh, I was happy to do the research and writing that came along with working in a research university like the University of Georgia. But I, I wanted to connect more with practical things that were happening on the ground. And I thought, what about uh, developing a center at the University of Georgia that would, uh, that could tie in academic research and studies with good policy? Uh, because in the United States, we do have this relationship that many academics uh, work uh, both in government and people like Henry Kissinger and Zbigniew Brzezinski started out in universities and went back and forth during their uh, careers. Others like our recent Secretary of Defense, Ashton Carter at Harvard, he and Graham Allison went back and forth. And um, they also worked in, in centers and programs that tried to apply uh, 
and utilize some of the work that uh, they were involved in at the university. So uh, I came back from England, and I guess just before I went to England, I was in Paris doing research one day, and I picked up the International Herald Tribune and uh, read about a Ambassador Martin Hillenbrand, who was uh, former ambassador to Hungary and former ambassador to Germany, Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, which included uh, Soviet Union, East-West relations under Henry Kissinger. And he made some comments uh, in the newspaper and was quoted on the research that I was doing. So I said, gee, I've got to go visit him. He was then retired from government and heading what was called the Atlantic Institute. And I went in and we had a wonderful conversation about my research. And at the end of the conversation, um, I said, you know, I've just joined a recruitment committee at the University of Georgia to hire the first Dean Russ Professor of International Affairs. I said, uh, you, you wouldn't be interested, would you? And he kind of smiled and he said, well, you know, uh, my wife and I were just talking about going home and she grew up in Fort Valley, Georgia. And uh, the University of Georgia sounds kind of attractive. Well, I came home and told Dean Rusk and others and we went after Martin Hillenbrand and hired him um, six months uh, later. So he and I in 1986 began to talk with one another and other people in the university about creating a center that would examine the kinds of things that he had been working on and involved in as a diplomat and I as a more as a professor. And uh, we came up with the idea of a Center for East-West Trade Policy. And we walked into President Knapp's office and he had gathered together all a, a number of vice presidents and the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And uh, we had written up a proposal and they had studied it and they smiled as we talked and made our presentation. And at the end, President Knapp said, you know, Gary, this is sounds like a very good idea, but right now we don't have any money <laughs> and we don't have any space and uh, we just, you know, we can't really help you, but if you want to do it, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll give you a green light. And so I was a, a naive uh, young midlife uh, professor and thought, well, we can do it. Uh, we'll show the university it's a good idea. <clears throat> I went back to Baldwin Hall where the political science department uh, resided and I had an office up in the attic of uh, Baldwin Hall before it was renovated and a couple of weeks later I had a little sign made and put it on my door at the Center for East-West Trade Policy. We, started, we got a very nice write-up in the Atlanta Constitution at that time and all of a sudden I get, started getting calls and people started coming to my office and I'd answer the phone. I'd say, um, Center for East-West Trade Policy. And they would say, well, we'd like to speak to the director, Gary Birch. And I would say, you're talking to him. Um, we had two faculty members and uh, one graduate student and no money. Uh, but good things started to happen. Uh, we got a grant from the Ford Foundation to host a a really important conference where we brought over, this was in, Center was founded in 1987. I guess in 1988 in Atlanta, we held a conference where we uh, called it Doing Business in the Former, well, no, it was still the Soviet Union, Doing Business in the Soviet Union. And uh, we had the president and CEO of Coca-Cola uh, high-level trade representatives from the United States and Washington and Moscow and and we got some more press in the Atlanta Constitution. Um, then we uh, we had this Ford Foundation grant and we brought over from the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe the top trade and economic advisors, people that worked directly with Mikhail Gorbachev and mm -hmm. the leaders of all of these countries. President Knapp was very good. We, they hosted a dinner reception in the president's house on Prince Avenue. 
uh, uh, the vice president for external affairs hosted a wonderful party at their home one night. We took them into Atlanta uh, and uh, took them to Martin Luther King's um, birthplace and some of the major attractions in Atlanta. And most important, we had some very good discussions that Dean Rusk and others participated in. Funny thing happened. Uh, a couple of days later, I was in my office up in the attic of Baldwin Hall. I took a deep sigh of relief and said, wow, that's good to get that behind us because it really stretched us. We were not ready. We didn't have a secretary. Uh, uh, we didn't have any facilities to put on this conference. In fact, I was a little embarrassed when some of the pre-planners from Europe came over and we had to work together and I had to take them up into the attic and sit down and do the preparatory work for the university. Uh, so anyway, we were stretched, we were worn out and a knock on the door up in the attic and uh, I said, come in. And this man comes in speaking a Russian accent and he said, I'm from Pravda, the major newspaper of the Soviet Union. I'd like to talk to you about this conference you just had. And I thought, well, who's this guy, you know, putting me on? I didn't expect that Pravda was going to cover this conference. And uh, I started trying to determine if he was for real, and he was. And we had a nice talk, and then I thought, well, I wonder if they're going to publish anything. Two days later, uh, a major article was in Pravda, which I have... Uh, a copy of and it opens by saying and this was in April 1st of April and the conference is among the beautiful dogwood blossoms and azaleas of this beautiful university town in Athens Georgia a major event took place in east-west relations and it went on to talk about how things were changing Gorbachev was in power at that time and uh, he talked about new thinking and he had really sent his people over here to test some of that new thinking. And uh, I remember we had a Noviet, no, noted Soviet political scientist over at Duke University, Jerry Huff, who came over. And during his presentation, he said, you know, the Berlin Wall is going to be coming down in, uh, in a few months. And all of the people from Eastern Europe, particularly from East Germany, gasped. And uh, some of them challenged him and said, how can you say that? because some weren't ready for change. But indeed, this was a, a great time of change. So we uh, launched the center, and that was uh, a big uh, change in my life because I, I tripled my work. Um, I became not only a, a university teacher and researcher, but also uh, an institution builder, a fundraiser, and uh, um, um, it was, uh, it was challenging and changed my life, but it resulted in something very satisfying and brought people like you and I together. I hope we can talk about that a bit later. Oh, absolutely. Well, one thing I wanted to, to ask you, you know, as you're talking about you know, the origins of the center and what was happening at the time, you know, I, I'd love to hear from you about, as a, a young professor at the university, what was the response from the students in the department about what you mm -hmm. were doing and what was going on in the world? You know, what was sort of the, the reaction here at the university to, to you grabbing that torch and, and kind of running with it? And, and you know, you mentioned the, the, the Pravda article, which was a, a story I hadn't heard mm -hmm. before. Is that, is that the moment or was it you know, earlier or later where you really knew you had something, something special right. um, with the center. You know, was that, uh, was that something that, that sort of, you know, you sit down and you, you look at that and say, you know, yeah. wow. Yeah. Well, uh, it was interesting, the reactions of, of different groups. Um, I mentioned the Atlanta Constitution did a major, it was a top, uh, uh, the head of the business page one day that there's a new center at the University of Georgia. And this is at the, when, uh, when Atlanta Journal-Constitution was a real newspaper. And uh, 
it got the attention of higher ups at the university. I think the presidents and vice president recognized that we were doing something significant. And there was a, a great student following. My classes were, were oversubscribed and there was a lot of student interest. But I was in a department of political science that was really, we said during those days, dominated by the uh, American politics. And we didn't have a strong and large uh, number of faculty in international relations. So uh, I guess my colleagues in the department sort of said, you know, what, what's Birch up to? Uh, uh, this isn't going to go anywhere. And, uh, uh, and we didn't report to the department. We reported to the Dean of College of Arts and Sciences. And slowly after we started getting uh, significant grants from the Carnegie Corporation, the Ford Foundation, and getting write-ups in Pravda and major newspapers, uh, the university started kicking in a little bit of money. I remember uh, the provost at the time, Louise McBee, uh, said, you know, I think we ought to give you a little money. We started with no university money and no office space. So uh, our first allocation of university money, I remember today, I was so happy. We got $35,000 for the whole year. And then in 1989, they said, we're going to give you a a little bit of office space in Baldwin Hall. So we went from the attic down to the second floor. And uh, uh, we really got going uh, and um, the beginnings of something significant. Uh, at that time, um, the Soviet Union was falling apart and there was a lot of worry about uh, what would happen with all of their nuclear weapons and missiles in this great uh, nuclear arsenal in terms of the possible proliferation spreading into the Middle East and into the hands of terrorists and so forth. Uh, Sam Nunn talked about the possibility of the largest weapons proliferation in, in human history. And um, um, Senator Nunn at the time and I began to talk. I remember uh, he invited me and I took my colleague Igor Kripanov, someone I'd hired in 1991-92, up to Washington to sit down with Senator Nunn and Senator Luger, Graham Allison uh, from Harvard and others. And they began to talk about how to respond to the collapse of these uh, nuclear armed states. And all of a sudden countries that had no uh, political tradition, no laws and rules and regulations like Kazakhstan and Belarus. They were independent states and had nuclear weapons. And so we began to talk about working together. Senator Nunn and Luger developed what became known as the Nunn-Luger program, where the, they worked and the U.S. Senate passed legislation that would put the Defense Department and some of their funding in working with the Russians, the Ukrainians, the Kazakhs, and others to secure these nuclear weapons and ultimately move them all back to Russia. And uh, Dr. Kripanov, Igor, uh, uh, along with you, uh, the best hire I uh, ever made, he and I started going to Russia and we started going to Washington and we started going to Ukraine and talking with leaders and with people in universities and think tanks about how to help them put in place the rules and regulations, laws, institutions. For example, we helped start in Moscow the Center for Export Controls, which was in some way, although a different name, very much like our Center for what became uh, International Trade and Security. I should say that after about five years, we renamed the center from East-West Trade Policy to the Center for International Trade and Security, kind of broaden our focus, and even move to move beyond just East-West relations because this became a global problem. And the real focus of our work, as you know well, was what could be done in this uh, unstable world to promote trade and promote security by making sure that 
so-called dual-use technologies like nuclear or space and missile technology were used for peaceful purposes, for nuclear energy, for medicine related to uh, nuclear and radiation, and for space programs and exploration rather than uh, missile systems and intercontinental ballistic missiles. And um, this was a very important area as global trade was growing. Uh, there was not much knowledge, particularly in the former Soviet Union in these new states, about what needed to be done to govern trade in a way that would promote security and make sure that dangerous people, including terrorists, didn't get their hands on dangerous weapons like nuclear and chemical and biological weapons. So uh, we were very busy in the 1990s uh, and, and focused most of our work on the former Soviet states from Russia to Kazakhstan, Belarus, Ukraine, and so forth. So when did you see the, the work evolving from the former <laughs> Soviet Union and directing your assistance and expertise to that region to you know, a more global um, or other regions of the world. I mean, obviously, we're, we're not going to be able to get around mentioning September 11th uh, and how that changed the landscape. But did you start to see this globalization evolution in the work the center was doing? Yes, we, we began to recognize that this was not just an east-west problem, but a global problem. And I had to smile a little bit because when you asked, uh, what happened to expand our work into Asia and elsewhere. Uh, at that conference that I told you where we were written up in Pravda, mm -hmm. we had a representative of the Japanese embassy in Washington come to the conference. And uh, he was a high-level diplomat who ultimately went back to the foreign ministry in Tokyo. And one day I got a call from the embassy in uh, Japanese embassy in Washington said, uh, Professor Birch, we'd like to invite you to come to Japan for two weeks to talk with our officials and visit our universities and, and so forth. And I said, well, this is a very busy time. I don't think I can do it. Um, and uh, they said, well, you know, it would be all expenses paid and uh, we would treat you well and make sure you got to talk with important people. And so I agreed to go for a week. Uh, <clears throat> but I didn't realize uh, what a good deal this was because I got to the Atlanta airport and there was somebody from the embassy there to meet me and gave me a ticket. And it wasn't an economy class. It wasn't business class. It was first class. And I'd never, in fact, I've never dr flown first class since then. It spoiled me. <laughs> Um, but uh, there were, in this uh, Delta plane, I believe it was, economy, business class, and first class. There were like five seats in first class. And it was the, the most enjoyable flight I ever had. I landed in Japan, and they had a driver and a guide. And, and uh, well, uh, so while I was there, I said I'd like to visit the Japan Foundation because I knew that they supported international work. And I said, you know, we have this center at the University of Georgia that has been working on these issues of East-West relations, but we know that we need to include countries like Japan and others. And that resulted in a string of grants from Japanese uh, sources, including uh, the Japan Foundation Program and Global Partnership. Mm -hmm. And that took me and others from the center, one of my colleagues at the time, you will recognize his name, who went on to become one of the leading uh, scholars and government officials in this area, Richard Cupid. Uh, he and I went to Japan repeatedly and started to broaden uh, our networks. And uh, Obviously, the Japanese and the Koreans and others in Asia have different perspectives, and we learned a lot from talking with these people. 
we started having Japanese students come and study here and Korean students. And then we started having people from China come to the center. I remember we hosted uh, a young scholar for a year in the center and he found out I had never been to China. Uh, this was uh, about the time that uh, I think you were in graduate school um, in the mid uh, 2000s, 2006 or five or six. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I said, well, you know, I've got my hands full. I'm traveling to many other countries. And he said, uh, well, we need to get you to China. And then I got invited by the uh, Taiwanese government to come over and observe a presidential election. And I thought, well, if I'm in Taiwan, maybe I ought to extend the trip and go to China. And the young scholar that we had at the University of Georgia facilitated that with uh, a non-governmental organization there, or it's actually a governmental organization, but the Chinese uh, uh, government uh, views as non-governmental, uh, a group that tried to promote international relations. So uh, our discussions then went into China and they, they recognized that this was something that they needed to worry about. They were becoming more active in international commerce, um, in technology transfer. They wanted to buy more American technology and we had pretty strict restrictions on what they could buy. Um, and uh, then on one of my subsequent trips to China, I uh, had read the months before I went over about this state-owned enterprise that was repeatedly sanctioned by the US government as being a serial proliferator. And I went to that state-owned enterprise and interviewed people and talked with them about what had happened. And uh, they were very upset with the U.S. government and the U.S. government wouldn't talk to them. And so they were very <clears throat> interested in talking with me to find out what had gone on. And uh, it was both a, a revealing and a somewhat uncomfortable conversation because they wanted to vent on somebody and here's this American and they didn't know really if I'd worked just for the University of Georgia or if I was also a intelligent agent of one sort or another. And I might just pause here to say over the years, my family and others uh, have sometimes wondered, you know, <laughs> who was I really working for? Because I did have access to a lot of interesting people in countries like uh, the Soviet Union, later Russia and China. And, uh, when I would return from many of these trips, I would get a visit from the CIA and they would say, uh, we know you were in these countries. Uh, uh, what can you tell us about this? And I said, well, you know, I work for the University of Georgia and this is a public institution and I'm happy to share uh, all of the public information that I can. I said, I don't have a security clearance the work I'm doing is not classified, but is to be available to everyone for better understanding what's going on. And so um, just for the record, uh, I never uh, worked for any intelligence agency. We never took any money uh, in our center and we needed money as we were struggling and getting off the ground. And we would take uh, support from other American, U.S government agencies like the State Department, their Department of Energy, that was publicly known, but we never took any money uh, that was um, tied in any way to American or other intelligence. And I think that uh, that was a good decision for the center because over the years, some university programs have got in bed, so to speak, with uh, intelligence agencies and got a lot of money from them. I also remember just after uh, India tested their nuclear weapons, I made a uh, trip to India with uh, two of the graduate students uh, that you worked with for many years. They were Indian and when I came back um, to my office in 
the center was in Baldwin Hall in those days. Uh, a few days later, the CIA showed up and they said, you know, we're really concerned about what's going on in India and Pakistan. And uh, we could put a lot of money into your program for we were talking about a new program that they would initiative that they would head called the India Initiative to un better understand. And we didn't have any money for it. And uh, uh, I said, no, uh, we're going to do as much of this work as we can, but we don't want to get into that. So that and other things made us all recognize that we're working on some important issues. And what really happened during those years, and you were part of it, you were one of the students that came out of the University of Georgia. We got our, our best people and we got most of our people that were either undergraduates like you were, who went on to graduate school. You started with the center as an undergraduate, uh, continued to work in graduate school. Then others had come here from India, from uh, Russia, Dmitry Nikonov, you know, who worked for the center for many years and now works for the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, he came from, from Russia, many from China. And we found out that they were just what we needed to go out and do um, the research. Uh, they were incredibly talented, incredibly hardworking and dependable. And they, I often say, they built the Center for International Trade and Security. I remember, uh, I guess it was in the... Uh, early uh, 1990s, uh, a number of uh, students, a uh, little before your time, I guess, that uh, were, uh, uh, we got some research grants to do research in the new independent states of the former Soviet Union. So we sent Mike Beck off to Russia and Scott Jones off to Ukraine and uh, Liam uh, Anderson off to uh, the Caucasus and uh, Turkmenistan and all of these places. And one day they came into the center and they said, you know, we've got a lot of interesting stuff here. We'd like to write a book about it. And I said, well, you know, first you've got to complete your PhD dissertations and master's theses and that sort of thing. And, but they were persistent. And I said, well, if you write it, I'll help you get it published. And I just brought it in today because it came out they wrote a book called Arms on the Market, Reducing the Risk of Proliferation in the Former Soviet Union. I showed it to uh, Senator Nunn, and he said, this is really good stuff. And he wrote the foreword to the book. Uh, we got uh, uh, pre-publication statements from uh, Senator Luger and uh, people in the Defense Department, Graham Allison and others. And this book was completely written by uh, University of Georgia students. And uh, we had a string of books that was written by this group. Benjamin Alvarado, Jonathan Benjamin Alvarado was going to Cuba and he wrote, wrote one about the Cuban nuclear energy program that the Soviet Union had helped them set up. Uh, Cassidy Kraft wrote uh, uh, a book, and uh, we had about six or seven books that were written by students in our graduate program, all published by Routledge, a major international publisher. So um, this was uh, this was really amazing, and as you know, Chris, these people have gone on to Suzette Grillade as the dean of International College of International Affairs at University of Oklahoma. Um, they've gone on to uh, top positions in the State Department. Rick Cupid uh, was first a senior advisor to the Department of Commerce on these issues and then went to work for the United Nations and the State Department on, on, um, on these issues. Uh, they became the top people in the country, and some who came from other countries, like Dmitry Nikonov, who's now working for the IAEA in uh, Vienna, Austria, the top people in the world. And 
when I would go to London or to uh, Berlin or to Moscow and say, I'm from the University of Georgia, they, they knew who we were, they, they knew our work. And then incredibly important to the center's work was about your time, we started developing an undergraduate focus. We always had undergraduates involved in the center, but we began what was known as the security leadership program. Uh, and uh, that was of tremendous value, and it got even stronger when you graduated and took it over and became director of it for many years. And you can tell me more than I can tell you about all of the incredible students who went through that and who are now in Washington and all over the world, who went to the IAEA in Paris, people like Jessica Satterfield and other, or IEA in Vienna, uh, who uh, served in international institutions. So uh, let me just pause then and thank you as one of the students uh, for what all you did, because truly, uh, you people built the center. There were not enough faculty uh, and there was not enough money uh, because frankly, we, we never got very much money from the University of Georgia. They saw that we were bringing in grants from the Ford Foundation and the Carnegie Corporation and from the Department of Commerce, Department of Energy, Department of State, and from international institutions. And uh, so um, they, they, we couldn't really hire faculty or advanced researchers. Uh, we, could, uh, we could, once in a while, I got a grant, or we got a grant at the center from the W. Alton Jones Foundation. I remember for $45,000 that allowed us to hire Igor Kripanov. And once Igor got here and everybody saw what he could do, we continued to fund him with external or so-called soft non-university money. And so our university budget remained very small. And where we were able to do what we did was to capitalize on student labor because undergraduates just did it for the experience. Graduate students were happy to do it for the experience and we could give them graduate assistantships that didn't cost very much. But um, it was great for the center and it was great for them because they had incredible experience I mean, all of those people went out and got uh, tremendous jobs uh, from your time up until present years. I mean, people like uh, Matt Furman and Brian Early, they did their graduate work in the center. They both got postdocs when they completed their dissertation mm -hmm. to Harvard University. And they both got tenure track jobs in very good universities. Um, then they went on to get account, uh, appointments at the Council on Foreign Relations and the, the top uh, think tank in this field out at Stanford, CSAC, the Center for International Security and Cooperation. So I guess the most gratifying thing in my professional life is uh, seeing what students at the University of Georgia could do and went on to do and the kind of work that they're doing now. A few people have said, and uh, I think Igor Kripanov said in a recent interview that I did with him, a uh, similar uh, interview like this for the Richard Russell Library's Oral History Project, that uh, through these students and through the center, we really had an impact on the world. Senator Nunn talked about the possibility of the largest proliferation of advanced weaponry in world history. That didn't happen, and there were a lot of reasons why, but the University of Georgia and our center played a role in that because we spent a lot of time in Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and uh, Belarus. I made many trips to Belarus when they still had uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear materials. And we were able, working with their governments, their officials, and their people in universities and elsewhere, and every time we went, we took students with us. Mm 
and I know how many trips abroad uh, you've made. And by doing that, I think we help build a culture, a security culture, a compliance culture, that there are rules and regulations that we can all work for that will make the place, the world a safer place. And so uh, being able to do that, and particularly in a university working with students has been extraordinarily gratifying to me. Well, I, I appreciate those uh, kind words, and that's actually one comment you know, I'd like to make and, and get your thoughts on is, you know, I, I was one of those students that was mobilized by September 11th to be interested in international affairs and, and these issues. And, you know, I, I know, and as you know, that the University of Georgia and elsewhere have seen sort of a, a, a massive influx of students that are interested in these issues and want to participate in security and in the world. And one of the things that you said a few minutes ago that has always really struck with me and that I think makes and has made the center very unique is that the Center for International Trade and Security did not take money to do classified work or work for certain U.S. government agencies which somewhat, I know in my time at the center, you know, that, that's been a topic of conversation. Where are we going to get money? We can go there for money. And it's always been this philosophical bedrock to not do that for one of the main reasons to be able to have students work on these projects, go on these trips, and engage in these issues. And, and so to, to sort of continue with this line of discussion, you know, how have you seen the contributions of students really shape the center into to what it is today and into the future? And how has working with students sort of shaped what you've been able to do with mm -hmm. trade secure? And we'll get into talking about that and your interest in China and so forth. Well, um, as you note, there was a lot of interest, and particularly after 9-11, this major terrorist event on U.S. soil. <clears throat> and there was a lot of concern after that, and even before that, but particularly after that, uh, we have these so-called weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, nuclear, chemical, and biological and uh, what kind of a terrorist event might take place with them. So students, I think more than maybe anyone at the university, uh, but also some faculty and some admin administration recognized that this was important. So our student programs became even stronger. We had more students interested and we involved more students. And as you noted, they did go along with us on these trips. And they had such a positive impact. They did so much uh, because there was so much to be done. And I and Igor and other of the older people didn't have time to do it all. And, and so we had to delegate it to you and others. And I know you and others wrote incredible reports uh, incredible articles that were published from everything from scholarly journals to reports that were circulated worldwide to international institutions from the UN to some of these groups like the Nuclear Suppliers Group and so forth on uh, what the issues were and how we saw them and what could be done. So it allowed, I think, people like you to become immersed in the work and become true specialists that were recognized. I remember we had uh, some visitors in Baldwin Hall from the Department of Energy, and Mike Beck and Scott Jones were graduate students and sitting around the table, and we were discussing these issues, and Mike and Scott, yeah, said, we, yeah, we've been on the ground studying these issues in Russia and Ukraine, and the people at the Department of Energy said, what, you, got, you students have had this kind of experience? And so they recruited these students to take on 
fellowships out at Los Alamos and other. Again, it was public, non-classified work. But that gave them even greater experience. Not only did they have experience coming out of our work at the university on the ground in other countries, but they went to our national laboratories. And you've extended that program greatly by sending students in our security leadership program, undergraduates, to do summer fellowships and internships at uh, these nuclear laboratories and elsewhere. So it was just a wonderful, you know, um, the University of Georgia prides itself in doing teaching, research, and service. And the center proved uh, to be, I think, uh, a wonderful example how all of these things to tie together. Uh, it was a tremendous privilege to teach classes with students like you and to develop and see your interest and um, experience develop. Uh, the research that we did together, students and faculty doing research, trying to figure out what was going on and what, you know, what uh, needed to be done. And then to take and use that research and the experience of students and to go out and serve our country uh, you know, we I've got a lot of letters in my file from senators, uh, Senator Coverdale and, uh, you know, U.S. senators, none, and senators from other countries. Uh, Mike uh, Espy, oh, I've uh, uh, maybe mispronounced his name, a senator from uh, oh, Wyoming. Enzi. Enzi. Enzi, that's right, Enzi. Senator Enzi, he's still a serving senator. Igor and Dmitry took him to Russia, a U.S. senator from Wyoming on the Foreign Relations Committee, and they took him to Russia. And he, he wrote us a letter and said, thank you, University of Georgia, thank you, Igor and Gary and Dmitry, for helping me understand as I serve on the Foreign Relations Committee what the issues are. And um, we have... Uh, had a tremendous impact and, and helped get through those years. Uh, things aren't perfect, of course, as we know, but some very, very dangerous uh, scenarios have been avoided. And you and other students and the center and the University of Georgia have contributed to, to, to that. Um, that gets us into work in other places like uh, China and India. And, uh, but uh, let me just pause here and ask you if there's anything you want to follow up on. Well, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, what are the, if you could give me sort of a, I want to say a highlight reel, but, mm -hmm. you know, what are the, the achievements of the center that really stick out in your mind? Mm -hmm. Um, when you look back at the life of the Center for International Trade and Security, I mean, you mentioned students and the things like taking Senator Enzi, you know, to understand Russia. You know, what what are the the big items that you feel especially proud of, and and how have those accomplishments informed what you're doing now with with Trade Secure? Yeah. Well, I think the the greatest satisfaction that I take is um, the impact and the opportunities, the opportunities we provided students um, and the impact that they've gone on to have. We have helped prepare the successor generation, the young people who would inherit the Cold War and a, a nuclear-armed wo world and try to keep peace and avoid uh, nuclear or other uh, disaster. We have uh, turned out, as you know, literally hundreds of young people who are making a contribution there. So I think that's my number one uh, uh, item of satisfaction. Number two would be having a significant impact on what happened after the collapse of communism and making sure that the Soviet arsenal was secured and working uh, 
uh, with the U.S. government and the governments of that region, Russian, Ukrainian, and others, to put in place some laws and rules and regulations that uh, were respected uh, by uh, authorities and have minimized the kind of proliferation that could take place. Thirdly, with the rise of China, uh, our work in China really took off uh, after the, the, the new, into the new century. Um, I did make that trip that I mentioned to, to China earlier. Uh, Richard Cupid and others from the center and then many others uh, began to go there. And we, we recognized that the Chinese are all about trade. Uh, they want to export, they want to import technology, but they could only do it in uh, a positive way if they had a good understanding with countries like the United States and Germany and European uh, powers and Japan because we had in place international multilateral rules and regulations that if the Chinese didn't play according to our rules, they could be easily isolated and pushed out. And so the Chinese were very interested in learning uh, about what uh, they needed to do to have strategic trade controls that would make an American company who might be exporting something to China to make sure it didn't go into the Chinese military or to make sure that it didn't get re-exported by the Chinese or sold at a higher price to some international terrorist or moved on to North Korea. So uh, we began to work uh, more and more in China and in Asia generally uh, to help them understand because they were globalizing so quickly. And then we found, and this relates more to our trade secure work, that there were a lot of companies in China that were playing by the rules and they were getting in trouble and that they needed uh, a lot of education awareness building about what their responsibilities were and that if they didn't play by the rules that they could be sanctioned by the United States and kept from doing business not only here but with our allies and, and others. So um, this was a source of satisfaction I guess just in, in general to have the opportunity uh, to work at a university where we put in place programs that significantly, significantly helped our students and significantly helped the world. Uh, that, uh, that means a lot to me and I think it means a lot to others like you and uh, Dr. Kripenoff and students from Georgia, students from the United States who've come to work with us and students from other countries. I got invited back to Korea a couple of years ago and I found out uh, that Korea, the Korean government takes a day that they called Trade Secure Day or Secure Trade Day where they bring up together the ministers and parliamentarians and so forth and they asked me to give the keynote and I asked them, I said, how did you guys get onto this? And they said, well, one of our young officials came to SITS and spent some time at the University of Georgia and came back and told us uh, about what you guys are doing. And now every day, uh, once a year, we have this recognition by all of our relevant government agencies, our universities, that this is something that we need to do. And so to, to see the kind of impact that we've had um, in other countries in the world um, is very satisfying. Well, uh, so building on from that, uh, you know, one of the, the programs that I was involved with at the center was the Academy, the Security and Strategic Trade Management Academy, also called it the Export Control. Academy where a number of these foreign officials, like you mentioned with the, the Korean scholar, you know, come here to the University of Georgia. 
um, and then take this training that we would give them and go out into the world. And uh, I wonder if you could comment a little bit on how important the academy and training, you know, has been uh, more so if, not, well, not more so, but if not on par with, you know, doing the, the legislative work that you used to be doing in the former Soviet Union as these economies grow. Exactly. I, I'm glad you raised that, Chris. It was a critical aspect or component of our broader programs, and you and Seema Galat and Mike Beck and others really built that into a program that could reach through literally hundreds of countries. What, what was it all about? Well, we found that it was difficult to send our people to 50, 60 different countries that needed training in this area. Because as we know, trade today is global and things are passing, dangerous things, strategic things can pass through various countries. And so you need officials in all of these countries who are aware and informed and who've had some training in strategic trade management who uh, work at the borders with customs and others to make sure that nuclear weapons are not being smuggled through or components that can go into nuclear weapons more likely. And so our center, uh, and you were very much involved, developed an international academy. And uh, thank goodness the State Department recognized that it was a good idea and they provided much of the funding over the years to bring um, young officials who had these responsibilities of strategic trade management to the University of Georgia for two weeks of intensive training. And uh, we've all met wonderful people that have gone back to countries like Indonesia and Malaysia and countries in Africa and Albania. and. Uh, Mexico and almost everywhere, uh, as you know, um, and you can probably cite the figures, how many officials have come from approximately how many countries over the, the last decade? Uh, it's, it's over 1,300 yeah. from over, over 50 countries. Sir. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, local people in town like George Allen, who always hosted a, a gathering, a reception out at the Athens Country Club. He would often say to these people, I love walking into the this room. It's like the United Nations. It's like the world should be. We're all talking and working together. And to see people from Nepal in their official uh, dress and, uh, and so many different countries. And they took... Um, the message that trade is important, trade is good, but we have to do it in safe and secure and managed ways so that we protect the security of our various countries and pr protect global security because we know that there are very dangerous weapons out there that if traded uh, and proliferated in um, ways that could get into the hands of dangerous people. So. This, uh, this was a, a very important program and a wonderful public-private partnership uh, between the University of Georgia, the center, and private companies that would come in like uh, IBM, like uh, General Electric and other aerospace companies to share their understanding so that they weren't just getting it from academics or government officials, but they were also getting it from people who were on the front lines that uh, were involved in the development and the marketing of this technology. So it was truly a, a, a team effort of SITS in the university with State Department support, with private business from the United States and abroad, um, uh, coming together and saying, how do we promote trade and security in the 21st century? And um, this program goes on. It's a wonderful thing, and I'm glad we had a part in it. Well, and continuing to talk a little bit more about 
your work in China and private public partnerships. Um, you know, as you retired from the center, uh, you know, you, you started a international consultancy, Trade Secure. If you could tell us a little bit about uh, that, you know, one of the things I've always been interested in is how that got started and how you see the next phase of trade and security policy um, and the role of, of private entities and corporations in managing this globalization challenge. Right. Um, I felt that after 40 privileged years at the University of Georgia, I ought to retire. This was eight years ago, 2010, and uh, let a younger uh, person uh, have my uh, position. And so I was pleased to retire, but I wasn't ready uh, to complete this work. I incidentally, on retirement, I was offered to come to China, to Beijing, and teach two semesters at China Foreign Affairs University, which is their main uh, training university for, for diplomats. And that was a great experience. But some years prior to my retirement, uh, I began to talk with others in the university about uh, the great uh, demand that was being placed upon the center for the kind of expertise that was coming out. And we could never meet all of the demand. We never had enough time and people to do all of the work that was uh, needed. And we also were getting increasing demand from the private sector for helping them put in place compliance programs and training and educating people in these companies. And particularly from companies from abroad that were globalizing so quickly and didn't have the, the people in their companies that knew what the rules and regulations were. So I started talking with people in the university. I had conversations with then uh, Provost uh, Jerry Moorhead, who went on to become president of the university, the vice president for research, David Lee, and many of the people who worked with uh, David Lee um, in how to manage a public-private uh, uh, partnership and spin a company out of the University of Georgia. I also went on South Campus and talked with people like Steve Stice and people in the sciences about the companies that they've spun out of the University of Georgia. Unfortunately, there was no precedent on our so-called North Campuses in, in the social sciences and the humanities. And, and the experiences in the, uh, in the sciences at the University of Georgia in area, areas like biotechnology uh, were not very helpful. But I, I, I spent uh, a few years and a lot of time talking with others about it. And uh, on retirement, I, uh, I, in counsel with the university and uh, nine other people who love the University of Georgia and also really understand these issues, uh, we brought together uh, 10 founders, me plus nine others, uh, people like uh, Alex Patterson, who was a valedictorian of the University of Georgia decades ago, went on to uh, Harvard Law School, uh, went on serving the Pentagon and the JAG Corps, uh, and uh, was a leading business uh, commercial law attorney with uh, Alston and Byrd in Atlanta, who had uh, just retired and come back to Athens. Other founders like uh, General Gene Habiger, who's been interviewed in this oral history project, a graduate of the University of Georgia who went on to become a four-star general and commander-in-chief of U.S. Strategic Forces, STRATCOM. Uh, Dr. John Rudy, who was a Fletcher School PhD who went into uh, an international career in banking, who, but who came to Athens and retired uh, in um, prior to 2010. Uh, Nancy Zhao, Dr. Nancy Zhao was a Chinese, uh, probably the leading authority on strategic trade and export controls uh, in China, who was uh, born and 
early educated in China, but came to the United States for her PhD, went to work for Texas Instruments, and then back to China, where she handled uh, strategic trade licensing and so forth for um, Texas Instruments. Um, we brought these 10 people together and said, let's form a private company that would take on some of the work that the university couldn't do or shouldn't do because of questions of uh, uh, security, classified government. I mean, companies like to conduct their uh, private work in um, a way that requires non signing non disclosure agreements and uh, so forth. And we were getting uh, requests. Uh, for work from companies in China that had been sanctioned by the U.S. government that universities like Georgia are better off not uh, dealing with. And so we, um, we developed this division of labor between the university center and uh, our new company called Trade Secure that uh, we would do this work with private companies that the university did not want to or should not uh, work with. And um, that we would provide internships to some of the students at the university who had gone through the SITS program. And so we started out uh, small, doing a few projects primarily in China with some very major Chinese companies private companies and state-owned companies that needed help and understanding, first of all, what American laws, rules, and regulations were, then what the multilateral arrangements and agreements were, and also what Chinese law was. And so we became a, a small consulting group that would go to these companies and advise them what they had to do. And in some cases, these were sanctioned companies, what they needed to do to be in compliance with U.S. law so they could get off this entity list or sanctioned blacklist and uh, begin to trade with the United States and do uh, regular business. So it was a wonderful public-private partnership because we were doing things that the university could or shouldn't do. We were giving university students internships and in some cases paid positions to work with us. And um, we were taking the name of uh, the university in Athens, Georgia uh, to places that it, it had never been. So this was a, a great experience. And, the greatest need for this, frankly, was in China because of their rapidly growing economy. These companies were just growing so fast, doing so much business around the world, but yet had so little training in the, uh, the strategic trade area that uh, there was a real need. And we have had a, a, a very significant impact. I remember the first time one of these Chinese companies called me, I called the State Department and I said, I just got a call from so-and-so company and they want our help. And the guy from the State Department who was uh, the head of this program, an expert in this area said, help them, they need all the help they can get. And so we felt uh, we were doing a service not only to these companies and countries to educating them on existing understandings and rules and regulations, but uh, a service to the United States because uh, we need more trade compliance out there in the world. We need uh, better cooperation and, and a better understanding. So it, it, it's a natural and a wonderful extension and something that's going on in universities throughout the country. Certainly places like MIT and Stanford and Michigan, other places, there are so many companies that grow out of universities. And it's good for the universities, it's good for the local area and their economic development. It's good for um, 
the Athens community, state of Georgia, that we have something like this. So we are continuing this work and um, uh, I'm the chairman of the board now of Trade Secure. I started out uh, in a more active role. I've served as president and CEO for a while, but I've turned those responsibilities over to younger people. I'm not traveling as much as I uh, did at one time, but I still make a, an occasional trip to Asia and Europe, and um, uh, there's a lot of exciting work being done in this field. Well, that, and that's a good segue to, to the last question I have for you while I've got you uh, captive here in this chair. Is, you know, you've been really on the front lines, one of the very few people, both economic policy and security policy for many years and have seen, you know, I, I think it's an understatement to say tremendous change in how the global economy has evolved over time and how security threats have evolved over time. And so, you know, looking back on, on these experiences and, you know, the work that you're currently involved in, you know, what, what do you really see as uh, the, the state of play today in global politics for economic security policy? Where do you see, you know, us in the United States or as the global community headed in addressing threats from weapons of mass destruction and ensuring that these smaller economies can continue to grow? Well, uh, it's a, uh, uh, an exciting uh, world out there, but it's also very, very messy and uh, dangerous. Uh, there are possibilities uh, for doing things that I think will take us in a, uh, the direction of peace and prosperity, but there are things that could happen that could result in uh, nuclear holocaust and the most uh, costly and bloody wars that uh, the world will ever see. Uh, I'm optimistic though because I've had the opportunity to uh, live through the Cold War, to survive the Cold War, and as Dean Rusk and others will tell you, there were some very close calls, but some good people did the right things and, and we made it. Um, today, uh, there are uh, challenges on our horizon dealing with China, the rise of China. How are we going to work and handle that? Um, the new assertiveness of the Soviet Union uh, and um, the many uh, other challenges in North Korea and Iran and around the world. Uh, I think uh, the opportunity though to learn uh, as we go through this tremendous change, uh, to be in a university environment, to be with younger people like you, to work together, to, to learn along with students, to learn together, to learn along with government officials and business leaders and representatives. This is this is tremendously important and a real opportunity. Learning is important. And it reminds me, uh, the Nobel laureate Albert Einstein wrote a letter to the University of Georgia in 1947. In fact, I'm sure it's housed right in this building uh, in the special collections beneath us. He wrote this letter and I've read it. And he, he was commenting on the challenges of the new nuclear age. The atomic bomb had just been developed. And he said, our hope is in learning. And he said, with, with learning, I am confident that the, Ameri the, the people will choose to live and not to die. And I think as long as we in this country, in this community, and uh, in our common world, 
if we can learn and uh, work together. It requires understanding. One thing that we didn't mention in the interview, another colleague and I at the university developed this global prize, the Delta Prize for Global Understanding. And we did that to promote recognition of the importance of understanding, global communication, working with others, because we can't do it all alone in this country. We live in a, a global environment, and what happens in North Korea, Africa, Asia, is going to affect uh, peace, prosperity, and security here. So I think learning, learning together, trying to understand different viewpoints, different cultures, different religions, but working together. And I think if we can do that, uh, we have a very uh, bright and satisfying future. Dr. Birch, I, I want to take the opportunity to you know, thank you for not only your contribution to my life and my education, but your great contributions to uh, the university, to the field, and to promoting this better global understanding, as you said. And thank you for taking the time to sit with me today and talk about these issues. It was a pleasure, Chris, working with you as a student, as a colleague, and uh, being here together today. Thank you.